Well, hi everybody, Lisa Tamadi here at Pushing the Limits. It's fantastic to have you back again. I'm really excited for today's guest. This is somebody that I've actually stumbled across in my search uh, to help my mum. And um, I'm going to be working hopefully with Dr. Sam Shea in the future in that regard. But this man is a very special doctor. He is a functional medicine practitioner. He's a chiropractor. He's an acupuncturist. And he's going to share some mind-blowing stuff with you guys today that I really want you to pay attention to. So welcome to the show, Dr. Sam. It's fantastic to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really, really enjoy sharing this information through podcasts. I love... I love teaching more than almost anything. And this is is such a great medium to help, just to help people in such a scalable way. It's it's fantastic. And and, um, everything that you've been talking to me about, I'm just like absolutely mind blowing. Um, And and the stuff that you have on your website. Uh, And Dr. Shea is actually in Colorado in America, has previously been in New Zealand and been practicing in New Zealand, um, is over in in the States again, where you come from. looking after a sick relative, unfortunately. Um, But he's taken a bit of time out today. He's going to share some of his insights around the 10 pillars of health, um, which is going to go... Now, Dr. Sam has um, such a wide array of knowledge that we're only going to be able to touch the surface on a couple of areas today, but I do hope to get Dr. Sam back to dive deeper into some of the areas once we've covered them. So, Dr. Sam, if you want to share, you've got a, um, a PowerPoint there. Now, I know that people are listening on podcasts as well as on YouTube, but for those of you who do want to see uh, this presentation that Dr. Sam is going to share with us right now, you can hop over to Dr. Sam's website, which is Dr. Sam Shea, that's S H A Y dot com forward slash biohacker and you can actually see the slides so if you're with us on the podcast and not on youtube you can head over there and we'll put that in the show notes of course right over to you dr sam tell us a little bit about yourself and uh what you've got there thank you so the 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 context behind all of this is that um i'm my background is that I had a really, really rough go as a kid in terms of, of being very chronically unwell, mm-hmm. poor health, lots of high stress from extremely uh, contentious divorce. I had severe insomnia, severe gut issues, uh, fatigue. I had developed a sugar addiction. I was dealing, at the, I didn't know it was gluten and dairy at the time, but I was on a high gluten, high dairy diet, which was not working with my system as part of my severe gut issues, but no one, no one really understood why I was unwell. It was kind of this mystery, mystery stuff going on. And both my parents being medical doctors, they, their particular training was not in looking at lifestyle in a holistic manner. It was more... Uh, it's in your head or you're missing some sort of drug or there's something uh, or you're just making it up. And the, the, the reality is, is that it was, it was far more complex than a psychological diagnosis. There was real physiological problems that were not taken seriously. So I, I was dealing with so much stuff. It was like a war zone at school with the physical and uh, psychological bullying. I mean, just as something for people listening here, uh, I'm going to issue a kind of an uncomfortable question, but it, it's it's an important question. It's like, what is the difference between a physical assault and physical bullying in school? Mm. And the answer is there's two things. One is it, what it, the two things are: you, if you're over 18 and you're out of school, it's called assault. Mm. But if you're under 18 and still in school, it's called bullying, and you should just get over it, quit whining. <laughs> yeah, very much. You so. know, and, and the, the verbal billing as well. Like if people, if people, if they're over 18 and outside of school and we're told the things with the level of vitriol and venom that I was told in grade school, the people who would say such things would have a restraining order put against them. Yeah. But in school, it's just like, oh, you just, oh, just, it's just toughen up. You know, it's fine. You know, whatever. But it's not. These things were extremely damaging, both physically and emotionally. And what compounded from that was an onslaught of severe physiological reactions, Uh, sugar addiction, video game addiction, uh, overeating, uh, constant postural torsion of being in a defensive mode that affected my spine. I was in chronic back pain, which I thought was normal for over a decade. I thought having pain was normal. 
uh, severe debilitating insomnia and all sorts of other things. And my, my, my journey basically, I snapped to it when I was in high school and realized that natural medicine was my only way out. Mm-hmm. So I had, I had to work through all sorts of stuff from like a coffee habit starting at age six. Wow. Um, all sorts of stuff was happening. And I, I recovered from addiction and burnout uh, by figuring out multiple, multiple modalities. Not because I went out and said, oh, I have to figure out multiple things. It was, I went through the typical journey I see most of my clients go through was, I'm unwell with this thing. Yeah. Whether it's gut issues or fatigue, or I had a head injury or some sort of neurological degeneration or a really bad accident or uh, brain fog or hormone dysregulation or gut issues or all these things. And I, someone told me about a product, a personality or a protocol, and I'm going to try it. Yep. And so I went and just did whatever people I trusted at the moment said to do, go see this person, go try this product, go try this protocol, go learn this, go do that. And it, I call it magic bullet therapy. Yeah. Where I would chase after. Yeah, looking for that magic, that little thing that will fix you, and there is no thing. There, well, there's, it can work. I actually figured out how magic bullet therapy can work for certain people. The model also explains magic bullet therapy. <laughs> the, 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 what, what happened was that for people like me who had multiple things uh, crumbling in their, in using the, pillar, the motif of a pillar of health, and in my model is 10 pillars of health, if you have multiple pillars crumbling, and if like what I observed in my clinical practice was that people with chronic issues, like I said, like fatigue or chronic pain or hormone dysregulation or chronic gut issues or brain fog or, or what anything else that's going on, they had a minimum seven out of 10 pillars crumbling. Wow. Okay. Now, what that means practically is that if you, a protocol personality or product at most helps up to three pillars. Yep. So if you're good at most clinicians, if they're honest, are really, really good at one to three pillars, maybe five or so like, but if you've got seven plus that are crumbling, you're going to like get unpredictable or temporary results or the plateau or whatever it's going to be. Now I had all 10 out of 10 pillars when I actually reflected back on my own life with the model. Yeah. And that's why it took so long to figure out what was going on and more importantly, what I had to do because there was no unified model at the time when I was struggling with what I was going through. It makes and sense. what I found is that if we assess these 10 pillars, if we assess these 10 pillars correctly and, and most importantly, just understand them, then we can start to really really chart a path forward instead of doing the magic bullet therapy where we hope it's this one thing that's going to work and then it doesn't. And then we feel bad and like, Oh my God, I'm never going to get well. Or this person, you know, was hyping me up and like, it was on, like they were just blowing smoke or, or whatever. And the reality is, is that if someone has nine pillars that are like 70% okay, and there's one that's at 30% and they just happen to find the goji berry juice to squirt up their nose or whatever, you know, and, and their bionutrient pillar happened to be the one that was deficient in whatever goji berry juice has. Then they feel a hundred times better than they're going to be the ones walking around telling everyone to buy their goji berry juice. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas if you're at, you flip it and you've got one pillar that's at 70% and nine that are at 30%, goji berry juice ain't going to do jack. Yeah. <laughs> and then, but the goji, the goji person who sold you the goji juice will say, Oh, you're not feeling better. Just take more. <laughs> like that's the answer. It's always more of the magic bullet as opposed to stepping back and looking at the pillars as a whole. So and this is does that, really key. Does, does that yeah. kind of architecture yeah. make sense? Yeah, because like we're not simplistic beings. We have very complicated structures. We have we have so many different areas, and this is what I find too. Like um, my my listeners know my story with my mum, as as do you, and it was very much a multi pronged approach. I mean, I didn't know about the ten pillars at the time, and we we yeah. have a 
started working with mum yet in regards to the 10 pillars, but we, but I took a very multi-pronged approach to the way I treated her. And when somebody asked me what was the one thing, there was no one there thing. There was none. There is no, uh, there were things that were definitely helpful and that I would, you know, uh, get people to, to look into. But it, we aren't simplistic beings that can take a, a little white pill uh, and everything's gonna go away. And we all want that because it's easy, but taking a holistic look at your whole health is, is I totally agree, is um, uh, a very, very important thing. Um, so you had adrenal exhaustion basically and fatigue and all of these things happening as a young person and you've used this experience that you went through to actually go and work out uh, how to get yourself right and now help you know, hundreds of other people with this knowledge. Um, so let's go through some of the pillars and, and how that works. Sure. So just, just a quick caveat in terms of the reference to the little white pill. Um, just for context, look, both my parents are medical doctors and so is my grandfather. In fact, my father and grandfather are quite famous in the medical world. Uh, and just, I'm, I'm not anti-Western medicine. What I see is that it's about application. Hmm. So Western medicine was developed from military medicine, which is emergency care, uh -huh. where you don't have missing eye syndrome or bleeding arm or like bleeding eye syndrome or missing arm disease. Those are actual emergencies that need to be stabilized. So Western medicine is genius and should be celebrated for stabilization of emergency situations. Yep. And that's really the gift of Western medicine. That's really with the primary use of medications. The, the it's, it's a Western medicine is predicated on stable stabilizing. Yep. The problem is when that philosophy is, is applied to non-emergency issues. Chronic states. Yep. Chronic pain, like that's where natural medicine is really thrives in looking at the chronic underlying things that are not emergencies, but are crippling. Uh, as well as the thing with natural medicine is looking at bringing people up to not just mere normal or mere absence of symptoms, but actually to optimal. So when emergency medicine if misapplied is uh at best masks the debilitating symptoms set of symptoms to give you a less debilitating set of symptoms little white pills are, are a radical sledgehammer to your physiology and you rebuild the pieces in a slightly different orientation mm. it's shifting the symptomatology you can't add a poisonous substance to a system and expect it to get healthier what you can do in the best case scenario is shift what you're experiencing and and i'm not being inflammatory when i say adding a poisonous substance when i talk about a medication yep. there's a term called an ld50 legal lethal dose 50 percent a medication cannot be classified as a medication unless it kills 50 percent of a rat population wow. in a controlled study so i'm not being inflammatory i'm being technical when yep. i say medications are poisons but they can be extremely useful to help stabilize a critical situation or buy time if your symptoms are so debilitating that you need to shift your symptoms to something more tolerable so that you can then do what? Look at the 10 pillars of health to figure out what's wrong underneath it. So we, we need to really contextualize the little white pill in a collaborative manner where there is a place for it. Mm. I'm not trained in the little white pill. Yeah, I, I'm trained in the natural side of things. I, I feel like what's what's really happening, what can happen, is that there can be a rejoinder of this collaboration, at of of natural medicine and Western medicine, and in fact, functional medicine is that meeting point. Functional medicine, which is what I practice, that is using the best of Western medical diagnostics. Yes. With the best of natural medicine lifestyle intervention, oh. and the best of functional nutrition as one of the tools yep. to help bring people back to balance. This is just so, so important. I, um, you know, I, uh, as a lay person who's not got a medical background at all, I've come to the exact same conclusion that there are benefits on both things. And there is, there's no such thing as a free biological lunch. If, you, mm -hmm. if you're taking pills, it's, it's going to help maybe with one or two symptoms, but it's going to be having other consequences, generally speaking. Um, and this is where, we're just taking one pill 
to cover up that symptom, which causes another problem. So you take another pill to cover up that system. And that's the sort of thing that's happening with chronic disease in our, in our society. Um, uh, and this different approach, and I, you know, there's definitely a massive movement at the moment, um, thank goodness, mm -hmm. of people like yourselves um, and, and other areas where there's new science coming online and there's new approaches being taken. Um, and this combined approach, I think, is a very exciting time for, for us. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, when you usually go to your local doctor, they're 20 years behind this stuff that we're talking about often. Yeah, and, and it's changing. I mean, the younger generation of, of Western trained doctors, they're, they're witnessing what's happening to their parents and grandparents, perhaps themselves or their siblings or even their children. And there's a whole new perspective that's happening where they are starting to look more holistically. And it's really people you know, it's, it's people such as myself who really want to create the bridge that we create these frameworks. And, and what the 10 pillars of health does is that it will prevent fanaticism, mm -hmm. even amongst the natural health world. There's some okay. people who think it's all about dealing with the infection or it's all about dealing with toxin of choice, whether it's mercury or, you know, sprays or whatever it may be, or no, it's all about getting the right nutrients or whatever. And, and the reality is, is that it, the, the, the 10 pillars will balance it out. And it also explains the entire cycle of chronic disease. So when we look here, we've got bad lifestyle choices or bad circumstances. So, so bad circumstances, like I'm a six year old boy and I'm being fed high gluten, high dairy, mm. having no sleep, being bullied and assaulted at school, dealing with the stress of divorce at home, having picked up an infection from swimming a lake at summer camp, chronic pain, poor posture, you know, all, all these, you know, all these things mixed into one, lots of toxic exposure. That's not a choice. That's a circumstance. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't have a choice. So, absolutely. So you get choices and circumstances, which are interpreted through one's individual genetics. You get one or more of the four adaptive responses. Mm -hmm. So people can respond to bad choices and bad circumstances. The body responds with the combination of inflammation, blood sugar dysregulation, free radical damage, or tissue breakdown. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if it's the gut, you can get inflammation in the gut, your blood sugar can get dysregulated, so your, your appetite and your, your, your craving cycles get all messed up, tissue breakdowns where the gut lining breaks down and free radical damage from all just, just creating destruction all around. Chronic adaptation interpreted through one's genetics leads to damage of one, of the th one or more of the three main body systems. That's the liver detox system, the gut GI system or the neuroendocrine hormone system. Yeah. So if you have chronic damage to your liver, your gut, and or your hormone system, you then get an expression of symptoms, whether it's fatigue or low mood or digestion, weight gain, cravings, insomnia, pain, burnout, hot flushes, whatever it may be. And if you have lots of symptoms, then people cope with bad lifestyle choices, which then leads to more adaptation, more damage, more symptoms, more coping, more adaptation and round and round it goes. I mean, yeah. this is basically explaining 20 years of my clinical yeah. you know, education in yeah. one slide, yeah. in one in a couple sentences. <laughs> and it's, it's really important to understand this cycle because then what the symptoms people are experiencing with or the expressions of their body trying to adapt, they make sense. It's not like a, some sort of unique conspiracy of the universe due to bad germs, bad genes, bad luck, or bad timing. And what we do is that we assess the 10 pillars of health in detail, then use functional testing, like checking the adrenals, checking the liver, checking genetics, checking gut, checking for parasites, checking, or checking the mitochondria, checking thyroid. We use these functional tests to clarify how the body's adapting and what systems have been damaged, and then customize a nutrition, diet, lifestyle plan while correcting the 10 pillars lifestyle in parallel, then you can reverse the whole process in a truly meaningful, sustainable way. So this slide, I mean, as I'm describing it for just our, our listeners, and, and again, you can get it, you know, you yep. can get this entire okay. ebook sure. um, from my website. It's, if you understand this cycle, then you have the knowledge to know that you can reverse the cycle in a meaningful and long-term way. And that's what functional medicine does. So with the 10 pillars, I mean, we'll, we'll go through each of the 10 pillars. 
The first one is called brain. It's called brain. Each of the pillars begins with a B because I'm, I'm a teacher. I like mnemonics and alliteration yep. and all that stuff. <laughs> brain is all brain and hormones. So we're looking at the adrenal system, the thyroid system, the sex hormone system. And in regards to the sex hormone system, we look primarily to uh, estrogen dominance, toxic exposure to outside estrogens, whether from microwave plastics or soy mm -hmm. products or uh, questions you know, questionable cosmetics and body lotions and, or All the chemicals. vegetables that have been sprayed or meats that have been pumped with hormones, depending on the country of origin and things like that. Like with the adrenal system, like I had severe, what's called colloquially quote unquote adrenal fatigue, but in reality it's renamed hypocortisolism, hypo meaning low cortisol, meaning low cortisol. Cortisol is the one of the hormones, the adrenals release that regulates blood sugar, helps drop inflammation, and helps you handle stress. So if you are unable to, and I have, I have all my, um, my, I have four labs that I showed on, uh, on my stress system, like the, the before and afters over the years, going from flat, literally flat line, yep. to te near textbook normal. That, <laughs> I, that I definitely it's, <laughs> um, yeah. I've just uh, had a Dutch test done, you know, dried urine mm -hmm. um, test done, and um, uh, it, because you know I've had a, and my listeners know I've had a very very stressful last four four years. Of course, um, yeah. my my so adrenal or hyper what did you call it hypocortisol hypocortisolism yes hypocortisolism I've got no cortisol basically right flat line from from the end, uh, beginning to the end um, and all of the hormones are out of whack. So low testosterone, low progesterone, low estrogen, um, and of course coming into menopause as well in my case. Uh, mm. So mine was even below that, that bottom one. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm, showing, I'm showing right now, I skipped ahead to the labs on the, on the um, ebook. So this is, two this is fascinating for me because I mean, obviously I'm, I'm dealing with this myself um, mm. and I know a lot of our athletes are as well that we train. Um, yeah, this, literal burnout. Yeah. Yeah, literal, and we hopefully we'll get into a bit of a discussion about marathon training and what. Actually, like, there's a good connection right here because with yep. the mar I wrote an article which I uh, quote unquote diplomatically entitled <laughs> "Why Marathon good. Runners Look Like Cancer Patients." <laughs> so I know a lot of people listening here are long distance runners, and I make <clears throat> zero apologies for that title. Yeah. And I'll tell you why because I grew up literally on T Bone Street next to heartbreak hill now if you do long distance running heartbreak hill for the boston marathon is like mecca like it's it is it is the it is a thing all runners know about and i it was literally up my street growing up and i remember six years old and and i knew i was going to be a doctor at age six i didn't realize it'd be a natural doctor i just knew i was gonna be a doctor and, and i'll give you an example i'm standing there with my mother who's also a medical doctor and i look at her looking at the boston marathon and people going by i said mommy why do they look sick? And she said, no, no, they're healthy. They're doing marathoning. I'm like, mommy, they look sick. <laughs> like, no, no, it's good for their heart. They're doing cardio. It's like, mommy, they look sick. All right. Oh, dude, so that's in, the end of a marathon when they are fatigued. And anybody well, no, no, it's it actually, it's not, it, we weren't like really at the end end of, of the, of, it was, looking at their bodies. It wasn't looking at the fatigue. It was looking at the ratios, their muscle mass ratios relative to their height. And they looked like cancer. I didn't know that term at the time, but they looked too skinny. They looked, something was wrong. And the relationship is to cortisol. Now I, I learned this from Dr. Mark J. Smith, PhD, who, who wrote the brilliant primer explaining the physiology in detail, but I'll give you just a super brief summary. And if you want more elaborate summary, you can go to my website and read that article. And there's a, mm. there you can also look up that primer from Dr. Smith. But here's what happens is that cortisol as a hormone is designed to keep you alive yep. under, under extreme life threatening situations. So cortisol is to basically tell your body to release as much quick to burn fuel as possible, sugar, in order to burn in your muscles as quickly as possible or to get away from the tiger or the wolf pack or the bear or whatever yep. your predator like choice is. Mm -hmm. So it will including cortisol will erode muscle tissue to convert muscle protein into sugar in order to keep you alive from the proverbial life-threatening predator. Yep. So the problem with long distance marathoning is that what, what's happening is that you don't actually 
uh, shut off the cortisol response. Jogging actually perpetuates this constant high secretion of cortisol for, and even when you stop jogging, it continues. Whereas with high intensity interval training, you get a spike of cortisol, but you get a concomitant spike of growth hormone and testosterone, which then heals the body, rebuilds the muscles and all the rest of it, assuming you don't overdo high intensity interval training. So that's why I don't teach H-I-I-T. I teach S-H-I-I-T, safe <laughs> high intensity interval training, or I call shite. <clears throat> Hope I didn't pull your podcast <laughs> off the, uh, put a flag on there. But say high intensity animal training because people can overdo high intensity animal training. Yeah, and, that, and they, yeah, because that's a, that's a something that I went from doing ultra marathons and extreme, extreme long distance for twenty five mm-hmm. years. Then I went and doing uh, high intensity short stuff, which yeah. worked for a while as well. But both have actually smashed the adrenals. Correct. Oh. Yes. Correct. And and that is that is so typical. Yeah. And and the reason and, and here's here's safe high intensity animal training is not an exercise. It is a principle in which you fit exercise into. The principle has to apply to, like my first practice in New Zealand was in the Bay of Plenty. I had, you know, you know, Porongo was like, it, it's, it's basically the Florida of New Zealand. It's the retirement community for New Zealand yeah. in the North Island. Beautiful. Okay. I have to give instructions to an 80 year old osteoporotic grandmother of how to do safe, high intensity interval training. If I tell her yeah. to do wind sprints, she's going to snap in half. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So the principle has to be translated across all ages. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not a principle. Okay. So you do that with the. Okay. So the principle again, the, the details are on on the yeah. the the blog yeah. on the blog and website. But in short form, it's you do a exercise that brings you to a deep muscle burn within a minute or less, followed by full recovery. Full. The full recovery bit is what most people miss. Or they over they go beyond a minute with the deep muscle burn. Uh huh. Mostly it's the full recovery bit, and you don't do high intensity interval training. You do at least one day of rest in between. Most pe- what most people what they do is they do this ridiculous thirty seconds on, ten seconds off, thirty seconds on, ten seconds off, whatever yeah. arbitrary number, and that is not unique to you. So for me, when I started doing high intensity interval training, I have a specialized stepper. And I had no weights that I was doing flies with or whatever. So I got on the stepper, minute or less, deep muscle burn, took me over 40 minutes to recover. Terribly embarrassing, terribly, terribly embarrassing, you know, whatever, fine. I just swallowed my pride and I just kept to that principle of a minute or less to get into a deep muscle burn followed by full recovery. Fast forward a couple months, I am doing the same stepper with 10 kg weights in each arm doing flies and my recovery time is less than five minutes okay so what improved my recovery time went from 40 plus i just stopped counting after 40 i was too embarrassed that first time to keep looking you were looking at your heart rate going back down to your not heart rate i wasn't i wasn't looking at heart rate it was burn rate and breath rate Heart rate is fine to monitor, but it's uncomfortable to wear those. Heart- back then it was, you know, you have these fancy watches and yeah, stuff that no, make it easy. But yeah. back then it was those awful chest straps and yeah. it was terrible. Um, so I, so I look for where the burn rate is gone and the breath rate is normal. If you don't have access to an easy heart rate, even then I wouldn't even do it if I was still had muscles burning or if I was panting. What happened was my recovery rate improved. And my, the intensity I require to get to the same deep muscle burn in the same minute or less improved. That's the measure of progress, not how much longer I, sh- I can go and not how much, uh, and, and not if I can keep going mo- for multiple days in a row. That's what makes it safe. Safety is about honoring your own biochemistry. Yes. And the reason why it's a minute or less is because you watch any David Attenborough special, okay? And, and you look at biochemistry, you, ha- you are an anaerobic glycolysis, which is geek speed for quickly sprinting away, using burning sugar quickly without using your mitochondria, meaning the very efficient long-term energy producing organelle in the cells to generate like, your energy for long-term health growth repair. No, 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 if your life's on the line and Wolfpack is not chasing you down, 
you're not interested in long-term health growth repair. You're interested in getting away as quickly as you can. Yeah. You have a minute or less to get away. And that is mapped into the biochemistry of your cells because anaerobic glycolysis is under a minute long. You but, watch any David Attenborough special, how long are those animal chases? How long are they? Less than a minute. But what about the whole persistence hunting, you know, um, like, I, I mean, I, I did a TV series on um, mm -hmm. we're born to run, that we're born for long distance persistent type hunting that we always used to do on average around 20 kilometers a day, ancestrally speaking, from one village to the next and one tribe to the next. We, we were doing long distance walking mostly. Um, that's it. That's, that's the whole, that, that's the key word, walking. Yes. Yeah, right? so I did, I did an... I did an entire presentation on, on walking once. There's about 12 major theories for the emergence of bipedalism. Yeah. Okay. There's multiple, multiple converging theories. Um, one of which is the ability to walk down prey versus sprint them down. Yes. Yeah, the persistent and, and, so, and so that's mitochondrial, not anaerobic. Mm. Okay. And the issue with, if you're bipedal, you only have two points of impact on your skeletal system versus four, which is more exhausting for a, a quadruped, you know, a horse or a deer or an antelope or a wildebeest or whatever. Additionally, we have less surface area exposure to the sun if we're bipedal. So when the sun's bearing down, uh, a quadruped, which has their entire back and their neck and they have fur, mm. they're going to get, they're going to basically get cooked. They're going to burn great. up by the yeah. sun. Whereas humans, we, we have way less surface area to get roasted by the sun. In fact, one of the theories, we have an extra hour of hunting per day because of that, that siesta period where the sun is the hottest. We have an extra hour to literally just like walk up and poke a prey while it couldn't move, it's so hot. Yeah. Because we, 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 we can vent, yeah. we can sweat. We've got, all, like there's, there's 12 major theories. We can also, um, I mean, you can look, Wikipedia is a wonderful article on bipedalism. Uh, it, it's, if people are really want to nerd out on this, I encourage them to go to Wikipedia, look this up. But things like we stand up, you know, a couple animals do stand or temporarily stand, but we like stand, stand, stand. Yeah. And that also gives us a horizon view. Like we can see higher up, we can see farther, we can look down. It also gives us an advantage for watching for snakes, which are uh, a real... A real problem for uh, for Back what you know tree drilling chimps that became yeah. land walking you know yeah. bipedals. Uh, in fact, if you want to get some really kind of mythological here. What is a dragon? A, a dragon is a fire breathe is is a combination of all the things that threaten tree drilling chimps over millions of years. Mm -hmm. Forest fires and lightning strikes, tree climbing snakes, predatory birds and tree climbing felines. So what's a dragon? It's got the wings of a predatory bird. It's got the tail and head of a tree climbing snake, of a tree dwelling snake, and it's got the paws and the jaws and the legs of a tree climbing feline and a breeze wow. fire, like <laughs> the forest fires and the lightning strikes. So that's, there's dragons in like nearly every culture. And, and like some of these kind of, these motifs are like genetically burned into us and we evolved as a way to compensate for all these major threats. And um, when, so with the, with the hunting, going back to hunting, uh, you answered it with the walking, that, that walking is the most single, most sustainable, yet stable, yet strong motion in the entire human nervous system. And there's multiple, like you, you relax and contract basically every muscle. So you, you have this kind of, it's like respiration. You breathe in, breathe out. So you can do this for long, long periods of time and not get fatigued. So why is jogging, you know, like when you're doing ultra marathons, obviously it's very, it is a slow, it is a slow mm -hmm. moving running. Um, why is that not the same? Because when you're jogging, you're in this kind of purgatory between walking and running when sprinting rather running is a vague term. I prefer yeah. jogging and sprinting and walking yeah. to be clear, yeah. to be clear. Because when you sprint, you go into anaerobic glycolysis and you create, there's actually five mechanisms by which you secrete growth hormone as a, as a consequence. When you sprint, you create the hormone physiology to repair and build up your system. And this makes total sense. If you're sprinting away from a tiger on Tuesday, you need a hormone mechanism to build you quicker, stronger, leaner, faster, because that tiger on Tuesday is probably still there on Thursday. Yep. So you're free to run away from. Jogging, 
jogging, you, you go faster than walking, but you don't get the growth hormone release you do. Mm -hmm. So you erode. It's, it's just because jogging does exist. It doesn't mean it's the healthiest thing to do. Like, because we have this intermediate thing between walking and sprinting, it doesn't mean it's healthy. It could be tactically useful, but it doesn't always mean that it's the healthy thing to do. And that's the confusion. Like people think that, oh, I'm training for my sport. Well, training for your sport is almost never training for your health. No, yes, I'd agree with it. And, yeah. and that's the same thing with jogging. Is it useful to jog in order to get food to bring back to your tribe? So you sacrifice a little bit of yourself in order so that you and your tribe can survive long term? Absolutely. Is it, is it safe to run up run up and try to poke a thing with a stick that has fangs, hooves, and, or claws is, is that, you know, is it's, it's, but, but there's these sacrifices that are involved and, and there's these intermediate, you know, phenomenon like jogging between walking and sprinting that have found utility, even though they are dangerous long-term for the individual. So, okay, so, you know, um, coming from an, an ultramarathon background, and I've run into a number of brick walls because of the stuff mm -hmm. that I have done. Um, um, I haven't run into problems like, you know, I'm still a very muscular build, and I know a lot of my ultramarathon um, colleagues, if you like, are not. The, the skinny marathon runner that's portrayed in the media is actually a bit of a mis nomer if you like nowadays it's all sorts of people that that do um and uh, we you you tend towards the sport in which you are, are, are suited as well so if you you're saying a sprinter looks healthy and strong and fitter um and and more muscular but they, he's chosen that sport because he is that way inclined a kipchoge marathon runner is also you know a healthy individual um but has a different uh, set of genes to Usain Bolt. Does that make so, sense? So genetics, there is a reality with genetics. Okay, that, that is a reality. But yeah. there's, there's the people that show up to win the Boston Marathon. This is where bell curve statistics matter. It's, it's the far, far, far edge of the bell curve that is glamorized and talked about and, and try to emulate in Runner's Magazine or whatever. And that's just simply a, an extreme of it all. Yeah. And the reality is, is that most of us people learn. are going to do marathon running. Marathon running as a whole is in terms of the cortisol system is extremely unhealthy wow. because it erodes away your muscle tissue. The way you tell the difference between a marathoner and a cancer patient is you look at their thighs. Marathoner still has some thighs. But it has a thighs because that's the only muscle group that's actually getting real any type of exercise in terms of muscle building, muscle engagement, whereas cancer, everything's eroded equally. Because mm -hmm. with the thing with marathoning is that cortisol is secreted for such a long period of time so consistently that it erodes the muscle tissue. And if people, and now there's benefits to doing jogging and marathoning in different senses, like they get outside, they get sunlight, they join a huge supportive community. There's an entire ecosystem of community support, language, uh, jargon, uh, clothing, so um, meetup groups, yep. food groups, food. Uh, like you plug into a tribe. And that has meaning. Like I worked with someone in Auckland who was a depressive and he loved his marathoning. Yeah. And the clinical call that I made was keep marathoning because that's where he is with people. He doesn't isolate himself. He's in the sun. He's moving. And I said, we're just going to work on your other nine pillars. Yep. But it is, it is more clinically appropriate that you keep marathoning because it fits the higher imperative, which is, which is move. Yes. So I'm not an absolutist. A real clinician is a pragmatist, not a perfectionist. Yeah. And, and, and for me, like running and for a lot of my community, uh, running saved their, 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 you know, their psychological state. For me, it saved it, my it, life. I don't think I'd be alive if I didn't have running because of running's power to get you out of uh, the, the shit that you're in, in, in the psychological mm -hmm. sense and the depression and the, 
um, and give you a sense of, of doing something positive. And of course, the endorphin high, the runner's high that you get and all of that sort of good, good side of it. Um, so I'd agree uh, with, with all of that. Um, I just And wanted- people say what you said, whether it's about Brazilian jiu-jitsu, yeah. Or dancing. Yes, yes, or yes. Med- like or it's and the thing is it's the you people, love. Yeah. What people confuse is the tactic, whether it's marathoning or jujitsu, for yeah. the one true way. True. And that's where the fanaticism comes in and that's where it gets dangerous. Mm-hmm. Where people think, Oh my god, you're questioning my running. How dare you? It completely <laughs> changed my life. It's like, no, I'm not I'm not, I don't deny the life changing things that it's done for you, but my job as someone who's in natural medicine is to not ignore the consequences of people going too deep into whatever thing they're doing. Yeah. Whether yeah. It's, it, it's marathoning or something else. And that's why the 10 pillars is a rounded out picture. And, and what I told, I'll, I'll tell you what I told this gentleman that I helped up in Auckland. Okay. Yep. I said, okay, do your marathoning, but, but do this for me. I want you to do walk, sprint, walk, sprint okay. a couple times during it. And then when you get to the finish line, I want you to sprint to the end into a deep muscle burn and finish there because the anaerobic burst will help you chew up the cortisol so it doesn't perpetuate after you're done. Wow, that's great. So, it's, mm-hmm. so you can adapt even marathoning to make it less damaging, but still enjoy the other peripherals of enjoying the marathon and like we with our run training system that we have we are very holistic in our approach so we get a lot of burnt out runners coming to us um who have done high mileage training so we for example don't do uh what i call junk miles um Mm -hmm. and we do the minimum effective dose basically and we build in mobility work and we build in so daily mobility work and and strength training, run specific strength training so that we can maintain our muscle mass so that we go. Yes, yeah, you got it. Yep. yeah, so it, it, it's, it's, um, it's a new approach to the running way of life, if you like, and it's building in some of the stuff that you're saying. And this is why I love these sort of conversations and being able to openly discuss these instead of going, oh, well, that's not true and I don't agree with that. It's to say, well, yes, there's, uh, there's some definite things that what you were saying here is, is I've seen it on my own body. I've, seen, I've made the mistakes on my own body. Um, and I've, we've, we've worked out a system where people can still do their passion without killing themselves. And that is by building in going anabolic, going strength training, going mobility, yes. having the right nutrition, yeah. uh, looking for you know the signs of that your body is losing muscle mass. Um, uh, the adrenal, whole adrenal sides, obviously I haven't mm-hmm. done too well on that one myself, but that more is from the stress of the last few years, I think. Yep, um, that would do it, absolutely. Yeah, that would, yeah. you know, one of your things was having a loved one who's sick and that's definitely uh, what's caused uh, my problems or some of them, as well as pushing my body too hard. Because we do, t- um, uh, from a personality type, in my case, very extremist. So um, have in the past gone to the absolute, you know, limits of, of crazy. Um, mm-hmm. And that in itself, I'm having to learn to, it has its benefits because then you achieve amazing things, mm-hmm. uh, exceptional things, but it also has its price. Uh, and as you get older, you start to realize that the extremes, like you said, uh, is sometimes better to be in the bell curve in the middle somewhere and not always be on the, <laughs> the absolute limits. So this is a really interesting conversation. And I'm, I'm fascinated with the whole adrenal um, side oh. of it. I'll, I'll share with you a bit more about my particular adrenal journey. So if for, I'll describe it for those who are just listening, but I'm showing my March 2015 results and I'm flatlined on my adrenal mm-hmm. test. And the adrenal, <laughs> this is a four spot adrenal test. There's an upgraded version where there's a six spot that's called the cortisol awakening response. We don't have time to go into that, but I'm just going to show you the four spot. Basically, your cortisol has a rhythm where it's highest in the morning because you need high cortisol to keep sugar in your blood to keep your brain alive while you sleep because you don't eat while you sleep. And then it goes down through the day and eventually is lowest at night so you can sleep. And then it rises during your sleep so you can keep your brain alive. Mm-hmm. I was flatlined. And then it got slightly better in March 2000 when I retested it in March 2017. I was still super low when I woke up, but my other results were more in the normal. Uh-huh. Then about a year later in February 2018, I had approximately the, exa- the same 
results as the March 2017, despite a much better lifestyle, I had a massive amount of stress. Wow. I had the death of my mentor, the, the neurodegeneration of my father with dementia, which is why I came back to the yeah. States. And so like, despite much better lifestyle, my, my adrenals basically did not improve. And then I have January, 2019, 11 months later, it's now near textbook normal. Wow. Because uh, just so much stress, I've recovered from so much of the stress and my lifestyle still continued to improve. So you can see that stress, stress, is, stress is one of the four of the 10 pillars that can be sledgehammered. Yeah. Okay, so most, so let's, I think it'd be prudent just to cover the 10 pillars in brief. Yeah. And then I can speak more, um, I can speak yeah, so more there is, about. There is hope. <laughs> there is hope, yeah. So basically the four, the 10 pillars in brief are brain and hormone system. Second pillar is bowel and digestion. You know, prioritize your poop, do your number twos. Yep. So how well do you chew? How well do you poo? Uh, you know, common mistakes, people rush eating or they have bad bowel movements or they skip pooping or they ignore gut problems. They, gut testing can check for hidden infections and, and how well you digest food. Pillar number three is a physical body, which includes old injuries, uh, bad dental work, which is rife in New Zealand, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, rugby accident was rugby. I found it was in when I was in New Zealand, I saw demographically for Men, the primary source of untreated injuries were car accidents, um, uh, car accidents, rugby injuries, and violence between men. And for women, it was car accidents, viol uh, uh, horse falls, wow. and violence from men. Yeah, those yeah. are the three the three main things I saw based on the gender demographic gender demographics for physical injury. Mm -hmm. And body pillar is also genetics. So I run a lot of genetics testing uh, yeah. through, uh, you know, all these for people like for people in New Zealand or around the world listening to this, like I do, I do telemedicine. So like all the test kits are drop ship, nutrients are drop ship, discussions are had through, Fantastic. you know, phone, you know, and so forth. So like I can help people wherever they are and the test kits can be sent to wherever. And the great company, FitGenes, that's actually in Australia, but the, there's a provider through New Zealand. And there's, I talk mostly about inflammation, the anti-inflammatory genes are really important for your runners because people who do who over-exercise, this is something really interesting. People who, the more they exercise, the fatter they get. Yeah. Have you come across some of these people? Yes, me. That's a, I've had that too. Okay, so that's a genetic issue where they over-initiate inflammation, they over-propagate, and they have problems quenching it. So when you exercise, you do trigger inflammation. That's normal. Yeah. But if you over initiate it and it over propagates and you can't put it out, like instead of a fire hose, you have a squirt gun. Yep. This is where you get inflammatory get weight gain, inflammatory water weight gain. Like your well, muscles you wash brief, out. Brief story, if I may there. I ran through sure. New Zealand for charity. So I did 2,250 Ks in 42 days. Oh my God. So, yeah. <laughs> and I put on weight. Yes. And I, it was, and I, that was a turning point for me where I went, what the hell? I'm, I'm, you know, 70 kilometers a day. Infl inflammatory body weight loop. That's it. Yeah. That's what happened. It's the inflamm it's inflammatory weight gain. It's not caloric. It's yeah. inflammatory weight gain. Exactly. And that, and I couldn't understand why the hell I thought I would be, you know, really, really skinny by the end of it. And I wasn't, and I hadn't even lost a lot of muscle mass, but I had lost, I had, I, I did gain fat. And I yeah. was just like, what the hell? This calorie yeah. in, calorie out business is absolute rubbish. So you talked about genetics before. Is it from the genetics testing, you can really help people individualize what type of exercise is best for them. I've completely changed people's exercise routines based on their genetics. I had one, there was an 18 year old in Wellington who was doing bodybuilding and she was addicted to these damn gym bunnies on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And the more she exercised, the more her muscle tone got washed out and her eczema flared up, her psoriasis yeah. rather flared up. We ran her genetics. I said, you need to exercise less and rest more because yep. you over inflame, you over propagate and you under clear. Now she was addicted to exercise, which I called her out on as a former addict myself as an addict to sugar and video games. Mm. I called her out on it and she, it was an uncomfortable conversation, but she acquiesced. So she finally cut back on the over exercise and yeah. suddenly her muscle tone showed up and along with the nutrition, the other things I work with are 10 pillars, 
the psoriatic rashes on her arms went away. Now, what she didn't do was follow my instructions to keep following up with me every month. And instead, she fell off the wagon because she got hypnotized by those damn gym bunnies on YouTube. And it all came back because she started over-exercising again. And so then we just repeated the process and, the, you know. Yeah, uh, so, we, we, we do something called epi, you know, epigenetics, um, so PH360 within our run coaching. And so when I, when I did that run through New Zealand and I realized that there's something wrong here and we ended up later on getting into epigenetics um, and I changed, I found out my genes, I should be doing you know, burst training, high intensity interval training mm -hmm. predominantly combined with something like yoga and stuff to, to calm the adrenals. Mm -hmm. When I changed to that, uh, which I did for a little while religiously, I had... I lost all the weight that I was carrying, which wasn't a huge amount, but it was for me, you know, annoying. Um, mm -hmm. I got fitter. I felt better. I felt stronger. Now the only problem with that was then that I went too much into the extreme yeah. intensity. And then, you know, once again, because I, because of the addiction that I have to, over, to exercise. Um, and that is a constant battle that I still obviously face. Um, so it, it's, it's fascinating what you're saying. So the genes, your genes are every person's genes are different, is what you're saying, and just because it the works combination, the, the combination of the gene variants is different, yes. and 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 so not everybody is going to react the same, and as coaches we find that too that you can give two people the same exercise, the same food, the same thing, and one will have the results and the other one won't because their genes are very much a different thing. Correct. Yeah. So wow. there's and there's not all weight. Not all weight is caloric weight. A lot of it can be inflammatory weight based on lifestyle, based on your genetic combination. Inflammatory so, weight. And then if you've got, and there's other things that can combine. Like for example, if men, the more they exercise, the fatter they get and they start developing gynecomastia or colloquially man boobs. Yes. When yeah. I run genetics tests on that, not only do they have the same inflammatory, over initiation, over propagation and poor under clearing of inflammation, they also had issues in their liver in their inability to clear estrogen. So what happens when you combine inflammatory weight gain with hormonal redistribution from excessive estrogen? You get man boobs. Well, yep. So put put these gentlemen on an anti-inflammatory, anti-xenoestrogen diet and lifestyle and nutritional program, and then they can weight and inflammation and pain and the man boobs go away. Wow. Like it, it, we have to check the genetics to really get clear on what the required lifestyle and what the dosages you might need. People, like some people have a multiples higher need for certain nutrients because of the genetic issues. Right. Like nutrition is not about like, I'm gonna take this thing as it says on the label. No, if you're genetically, if you're genetically have, uh, you know, very unfavorable variants, you may need multiples more, which is why you need a clinician to actually help you interpret this because mm -hmm. not it's just like not everyone responds the same way to exercise not everyone responds the same way to nutrition the exact exact same so, issue exact so same so true so true and yeah that that's that's really fascinating and we we are exposed to so many xenoestrogens now that yeah that's the part end. of the toxins yeah it's part yeah. pillar number 5 is biotoxins and this is this pillar is unfortunately just growing day by day with the amount of exposure and volume of toxins and mm. It can be it can be everything from cigarette smoke to heavy metals to xenoestrogens to petrols to sprays to off gassing of carpets, paints, mm. you know, rugs, new cars or or old oh, cars or whatever yeah. it is, uh, preservatives in the food and, and whatever you can imagine. This one's really tough. And the real the thing that people need to do is not go on a detox. That's not what they need to do because if you don't have your other nine pillars in place, detox can hurt you. It's, I've hurt myself doing cleanses prematurely. Yep. It's very difficult for the body to cleanse. It requires a lot working. Your gut's got to work. Your adrenals got to work. You've got to have the right nutrition. You've got to be able to sleep. Like there's all these other things that have to be put in place. And like the number one things that people can do is like just start eating real food. Just avoid toxic exposure and start eating real food. There are functional tests out there like a mitochondria test that I run mm. that has checks for six of the liver pathways. And, wow. and you want to make sure your pathways are working before you start detoxing. Because if you don't, then you create backlogs and then the toxins get recirculated and get into the organ systems and cause all sorts of problems. Wow. The same thing with heavy metals. Like a lot of people uh, freak out over heavy metals and really it's premature. They should focus on helping the other 10 pillars of health first, the other nine pillars, then focus on detox. 
Then you've got pillar number six is bionutrients. This is all of nutrition. Again, very controversial subject. Uh, I, everything you put in your body that you need, fatty acids, amino acids, um, you know, proteins, uh, vitamins, minerals, and I also put oxygen and sunlight, which is one of the real benefits of getting out there to yeah. do jogging or sprinting yep. or walking is that you do get sunlight and oxygen, and that's real. Mm. And it, like I said, like if people are so committed to their marathon addiction, there's ways to mitigate the damage, you know, by doing the walk, sprint, walk, sprint. And they can also focus on the nine pillars to help round stuff out. Like what you described with balancing out with muscle building, like that's, that's what I teach people who will not let go of marathoning yeah. when it's clearly gone too far. Yeah. The and you just, it's a reality. Like people will do what they do. So it's like, okay, let's just mitigate this. You know, yeah. let's, let's adapt this to your situation. Um, there's lots of stuff you can do to check for diet. Like you can actually do a genetic test to check to see what your carb tolerance is. Are you suited for keto, paleo, Mediterranean, or high carb? You can actually genetically test this. Mm -hmm. Like it's called carb choice again by Fit Genes. Like I'm, I lecture on this at the Fit Genes conferences. Like this is, this is one of my absolute favorite functional tests out there. Completely changed my, I've been teaching diet for 15 years. Yep. And, and this thing utterly changed my diet for the better. I wish I had found this out 20 years ago. So all these, this controversy over diet, again, you can just do a cheek swab and figure it out. It, the, the technology, again, functional medicine, the best of Western medical diagnostics. This is one of them. Genetic testing is one of those diagnostics. And then you use the natural medicine lifestyle interventions to actually change your life for the better for the long term. Seventh pillar is breakfast, which is really about breakfast and routines and habits. Because mm -hmm. I found the majority of my chronically unwell clients and patients, they had crap breakfast. And so that was my first ebook, which people can still get for free off my website. It's, they had bad breakfast. And I found the fastest way to get people to feel better was to fix their breakfast. Yeah. And I also realized that it was about routines. Like some of the sickest people I've ever worked with in my life were shift work nurses. Mm. Shift work nurses, the single most unwell class of people yep. I have ever met in the broad population. Sure, like coal miners that are diving into like the depths of like those, yeah. of course, that they're extreme. I'm talking about like in the global population, there's so many nurses. Well, five, the the five shift five work, husband. Yeah, who, who, yeah, just it throws them all off. Yeah. Like their cortisol system. Yeah. Um, we talked about my cortisol tests here. You do adrenal tests for rhythms. The bothers is a, is a pillar for stress, all form, whether it's dealing with a sick relative mm. or it's, you know, cluttered like Marie Kondo and her life changing magic of tidying up book like that's <laughs> that's hitting gangbusters because clutter is a stress, financial stress, emotional stress, relationship stress, spiritual stress, societal stress, and too much news is a stressor. Um, overwhelm, just all yeah. these things that this is one of the four pillars that can be sledgehammered. Uh, bugs or hidden infections and mold is another one of the pillars that could be sledgehammered. Massive food poisoning or a massive tropical infection, that's, that's your pillar being sledgehammer can take you down. A massive stressor like losing uh, a loved one or losing a job or a divorce or a move or something significant or like uh, your house, you know, your house oh. having a collapse or a storm that destroys something. That's a sledgehammer to your pillar. The other sledgehammers are the biotoxins. You get massively exposed to something acute, that can sledgehammer you. The other one is the third pillar, the body pillar. You have a massive accident, a car accident, yeah. or, or yeah. violence, or whatever yeah. it is, a horse fall. That's a, that can be a sledgehammer. So the four pillars can be sledgehammered, infections, stress, toxins, and physical accident. All the rest almost always are crumbled. Like you don't get chronically unwell from missing one night of sleep. You do if you have the other nine pillars have been crumbling chronically for the long term. And that was the proverbial straw on the camel's back. Yep. So you got, and then the 10th pillar is bedtime, which is sleep. So these, these are the 10 pillars and the 10 pillars are, they're designed to, um, they're designed to help round out people's, learning and implement more importantly the implementation of natural health most people get really fixated on one to three pillars and they think that's health and that is simply untrue it's partial 
And like, oh, it's all about exercise. No, it's all about diet. No, it's all about the mind. I'm like, yes, and there's seven other things you got to look at. Exactly. And yeah. and people are chronically unwell, or they they don't understand what's happening. They have to look get to the rest of the pillars. There's something missing. If you're talking about brain rehab, how do you rehab a brain? Ten pillars. That's how you rehab a brain. And some pillars are usually more important than others in certain certain respects like for brain rehab sleep is super important like it's important for everybody but sleep is real important uh deep sleep particularly uh looking at putting them on usually like intermittent fasting or a ketogenic diet is a really useful therapeutic tool even if it's temporary mm -hmm. to help put rebuild mitochondria basically focusing on mitochondrial regrowth uh, high intensity, safe high intensity interval training would really help, you know, because if there's growth hormone involved, the two best ways you get growth hormone naturally is high intensity interval training mm -hmm. and deep sleep. Okay. Um, there's brain based nutrients, uh, like again, like the, the mitochondria profiles all help with that. Understanding genetics and quenching inflammation is really important. Uh, this, this is where things are really nuancing and individual, but. Like, that, yeah, this is an area that obviously I'm super interested in with mum and trying to get yeah. the, the optimum out of her brain. Um, Anybody, obviously. Um, yeah, and then there's brain-based exercises, like the specific. That's where things like a functional neurologist comes in. Yeah. Um, there are functional neurologists in New Zealand. That there's three last time I checked, but there's there are people who are trained to actually help assess what type of exercises you need to help. Uh, activate certain regions of the brain that need activation because in order to rebuild a brain you need to provide the nutrition and the background physiology like of, of the hormone system and growth hormone and all this other stuff then you need to activate the part of the brain that needs activating more importantly the part of the brain that precedes the area of the part of the brain that needs activating so you have like it it builds it up in fact yep. one way one way to understand Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Someone's trying to ring through. That's typical, isn't it? We'll just keep going. Sure. I'm sure they'll go away in a minute. <laughs> right, right. So maybe it's a call-in show. Maybe that's your new gig, right? <laughs> you have a call-in podcast? <laughs> you can't even turn it off on the internet. That's the problem. You can't? All right. <laughs> so guys. If, if, if people want to understand the brain in very simplistically but very accurately, the brain develops from the back forward, from the bottom up, from the middle out. Yeah. So where is the most primitive part of the brain? The brain stem. It's the farthest down. It's yep. the farthest back, and it's the most midline. What's the most advanced parts of the human brain? The fr the side of the frontal, like the front outer upper part, like speech. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you're gonna rehab a brain, you do the exercises from the bottom up, from the middle out, from the front back to the front, right. because then you build the foundational. Because the, the, up, the frontal lobes are very fragile. They need to have a stable platform of all the other structures of the brain beneath it and behind it and below it in At order to sustain thing, the, plas the, the changes. Yes. The first part that goes, isn't it? Whenever you have a stress response or when you, Correct. you know, like Correct. And I've noticed with mum, whenever anything like heat, you can't tolerate heat because um, her temperature regulation is, is mucked up and uh, her, her, her frontal lobes shut down for the want of a better description. She yeah. can't function as well as soon as she overheats or any of the things like an infection. Right. Her brain power will go down quicker than you you or I. Um, yeah, exactly. That, it's the yeah. frontal lobes. They're most fragile uh, to, and susceptible to hypoxia, which is lack of oxygen, to stress, which is a, to toxic exposure, to sleep deprivation, to hidden infections, to you know your rhythms being off. That creates a stress response. Wow. Uh, poor nutrition. The stress that comes, like if your spine's misaligned from chronic, you know, untreated injuries or sitting too much, you know, misaligned spine, you don't have to have pain to have a misaligned spine, but what happens if you have a misaligned spine, it creates a stress signal up into the brain, which then creates a global stress response, which wow. then shuts down the frontal lobes. Like there, there's all sorts of ways that the frontal lobes can be affected and you can map those onto the 10 pillars of health. Wow. So my, my invitation to people who are listening to this is that get get my book on biohacker biohacking which is basically what i just described It's like what, what's the thirty thousand foot view you can get that at 
drsamshay.com, D-R-S-A-M-S-H-A-Y.com forward slash biohacker. Get this ebook and you can go through the 10 pillars on your own time. There's a lot more detail in it and there's all the visuals in it. And, you know, at the moment, if, if the way that my practice is set up is like, if people want a personal, you know, want personal interaction with me and are interested in working with someone like me who has a system like this, there's information in the ebook of how you can set up uh, a, a 15 minute like, chat with me yep. at the time of this recording and no charge to, to talk with me about your unique situation. And I'll go through like the 10 pillars of health, like the 10 pillars of health is the framework. My, the, the, uh, a full proper consult, that's when someone has to do like do this team. online survey that's secure and all the rest of it. And it goes yep. through each of the pillars explicitly. Like Which pillar number cool. one, 20, 30, 40 questions. Pillar yeah. number two, blah, 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 blah. So it's an education for oneself to go through it, but really it's an efficient way for me to analyze what pillars have been crumbling, when, why, how, and and where and then more importantly what pillars need to be rebuilt in what order to get you feeling better as quickly as possible because, yeah then using functional testing like adrenal thyroid mitochondria liver genetics food intolerances gut parasites using functional testing to actually clarify how the body has been adapting whether it's inflammation or blood sugar free radicals or tissue breakdown and what organ systems have been harmed in order to customize a nutrition and diet lifestyle plan so that you can reverse the whole process. And that's, that's really what I focus on in terms of these 10 pillars. And, and I, I, I've been there with the chronic unwell thing. Mm. I did that for well over a decade. Yeah. So you know what we're all going through. Absolutely. And, and this is a very complicated system. Like you're not going to be able to work it all out on yourself. You might work out some parts of it. And, you know, we, we at Running Hot Coaching, which is our company, we are constantly looking for the next, because there is this, this now personalized health revolution that is coming at us. And this is a new aspect that we will be able to add to what we're doing and to perhaps work, work in with you. Um, mm -hmm. And the stuff that we're doing with epigenetics and so on this is all a really exciting area um, that people can actually start to take control back and this is a really I think it's super important that people understand that it's the old way of just going to your local doctor and expecting everything to be taken care of is very it was way too simplistic as you can see there is a whole lot of other areas that we need to be looking at and we need to take first and foremost responsibility for our own health and and search out the people that can help you and whether that's dr sam um or other functional medical people or um you know, with the likes of what we're doing, all of these aspects can help you achieve optimal health, which is what we're all about really on the show. Um, so Dr. Sam, I think that's probably a good place to, to wind it up. Are there any mm -hmm. sort of uh, last thoughts? So people can do teleconsulting with you, they can get the tests done, they can work through this whole process with you. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything that you want to, as a parting, parting comments today, to share? My request to people is, is to really take some time to learn the 10 pillars because what it will do is will contextualize everything you ever have learned about natural health and everything you ever will learn. Meaning that you now have the roadmap, you have the framework by which to understand everything else you'll ever learn. So you're not, you know, mesmerized or bewildered or overwhelmed or mm -hmm. become a fanatic about the latest podcast, news magazine article, whatever's on the morning show or whatever your friend tells you is the latest goji juice. You know, you'll be able to put everything you've ever learned into context of these 10 pillars. So you have a balanced, logical, holistic approach and you don't get lost or become a health extremist in any one particular pillar because I mean, the 10 yeah. pillars will balance it out. Everything will be balanced out and you don't go too far in any direction. Mm -hmm. And that is a real gift to, to know that you can now slot everything you ever have learned and everything you ever will learn into a meaningful, easy to understand framework. I know 10 pillars may seem like a lot, but, but I, I promise you I've studied frameworks you know, for years and years. Like this is the one that is the best combination of learnable yet comprehensive. Mm. And that's what I would encourage people to do. You just, just get the ebook and it's, it's available for free. 
You'll also, if you get it, you'll, you can be on my newsletter. Uh, you'll learn about some of the other, you know, lectures I give online and, yeah, and which totally other resources fantastic. and all sorts of stuff I can help you with. Yeah, because we've only just touched the surface of this, this stuff and obviously it can get quite complex and we could we could go into a, some really deep uh, conversations, which yeah. would be fascinating. Yeah. But Dr. Sam, um, thank you so much for being on the show today. So everybody go to drsamshay.com and if you want the, the uh, ebook, go to .com forward slash biohacker. We'll put the notes in the, um, uh, the, the links in the notes. Um, it's been a fascinating ride with you today to understand just a little bit and some very, um, you know, uh, challenging concepts for, for, our, for runners, for us to be mm -hmm. thinking about. But I think it's really important that we don't put our heads in the sand and just go, I'm going to continue doing the same thing and it's all going to be good because that's when we come unstuck. So understanding mm -hmm. the new knowledge and bringing that into your life. And certainly um, I'm going to be, uh, you know, chasing up with mum and her story um, and mm -hmm. getting, getting your help with her 10 pillars and trying to take her to the next level. Um, we have so it out. Thank you very much uh, for your time today, Dr. Sam. And, you know, have, have fun over in Colorado and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Okay. Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed being here.